Hello again from downtown Cleveland. Where Republicans are gathering ahead of their party's national convention next week. On tonight's show, we have a brand new Bloomberg Politics slice poll with some surprising and potentially important results about how Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are doing among college educated voters across the country. But first, a triptych of unusually large and consequential political news stories today. One, about democratic unity in the North. Another, about beep stakes intrigue in the Midwest. But we begin in the South, specifically in Dallas, where President Obama and former President George W. Bush gave emotional, consoling, spiritually searching speeches this afternoon at the memorial service for the five police officers slaughtered by a lone gunman in the Big D last week. Both Bush and Obama found grounds for hope and optimism for a country with overwhelming cause for despair over the deep divisions that bedevil our nation. Both presidents praised the law enforcement community and called for unity and reconciliation. I'm here to insist that we are not as divided as we seem. And I know that because I know America. I know how far we've come against impossible odds. At our best, we honor the image of God we see in one another. We recognize that we are brothers and sisters sharing the same brief moment on earth and owing each other the loyalty of our shared humanity. Mark, we'll play some more extended excerpts from the Dallas service in just a minute. But first, what about this event today struck you most? These are two guys who have done this before, and I thought they were both just extraordinary. There's so many constituencies, there's so much negativity, so much conflict within the country, and I thought both of them did just a beautiful job. Uh, and and some, one level remarkable and one level not because they are so good at it. They've been through this crucible before at uniting the country and at being optimistic at a time when a lot of people in America are wondering where the optimism can come from. Right. I agree with that, of course. Um, it was in, in, a, in a weird way. It was good to see George W. Bush up there. Uh, he's had done so little of this kind of thing since he's been out of the White House uh, to see him back and be reminded of how good he can be in situations like this. And of course, President Obama is a horrible through line of his presidency, these, these events that have taken place, these shootings, uh, the mass shootings in some cases, individual shootings in other cases. He's had to console an awful lot of parents. He mentioned it twice that he's done too many of these things. But as grim as it is, as you say, he's gotten very good at it. And his, his ability to call on scripture and speak the language of spirituality, uh, very powerful. Uh, it was very powerful last summer when he did it uh, in Charleston, very powerful again today. One of the things they both did that's, again, a remarkable and uh, a remarkable ability is they every almost every sentence they said, you, you'd hear it and you'd say, well, that's of course that's true. And yet it had power yeah. in, in the way they built the narrative of what they were talking about and also power of the, of the whole tableau uh, of all races, religions, parties up there. Uh, I'm not sure the whole nation focused and paid attention. But my instinct is that Dallas, at least, where, of course, everyone would have watched, is going to have a lot of good feeling today in trying to help fight back from the horrible week that they've had. Yeah, for sure. And, and, it's no, and it's no diss to President Bush to say that, obviously, President Obama's speech more important and in two ways, right? A longer speech, and rightly so, given that he's the sitting president. But also, he comes in, in from a unique place, of course, as the first African-American president. And his... In some ways, the speech recalled to me the speech that he gave famously on race back in 2008, where he talked in such a powerful way in the, in the middle of the Jeremiah Wright controversy to the white constituencies that he needed to address and to the black constituencies, asked for both sides to try to empathize with the other. Um, he gets criticism from the right. Uh, for focusing too much on police brutality against black victims. He gets criticism from the left for focusing too much on the white police officers. I think it's, he's perfect pitch on these things. And the way that he spoke, again, to both constituencies today uh, in a way that was real and bracing and in a measured way uplifting, I think, was just about perfect. Now, I, I followed on Twitter, as a lot of us do watching big events, and saw a lot of conservatives early on praising the president. And I thought, this is right. great. This is great to see that uh, some people who are normally regular critics of the president praising him. And then by the end, they were carping and sniping and nitpicking at little things. I thought this was a day to put, set that aside. And, and more than usual, that happened. And, and again, to see both presidents up there and, and of course, uh, the President Bush and Mrs. Obama chatting away was just, it was a great day for the country at a time when we needed a great day. All right, our second big story has more to do with politics. Bernie Sanders. Vermont senator, former presidential candidate, after weeks of buildup, 
delivered a rousing and unambiguous endorsement of Hillary Clinton out on the campaign trail today. Before hugging his former Democratic rival in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Sanders read his extraordinarily unifying and supportive speech from the teleprompter, finally summoning the words that many Democrats have been longing to hear, and then Clinton paid back the favor. Hillary Clinton understands that we must fix an economy in America that is rigged and that sends almost all of the new wealth and income to the top 1%. Hillary Clinton will make an outstanding president, and I am proud to stand with her today. It is such a great privilege to be here with Senator Sanders, being here with him in New Hampshire, I can't help but reflect how much more enjoyable this election is going to be now that we are on the same side. Because you know what? We are stronger together. And throughout this campaign, Senator Sanders has brought people off the sidelines and into the political process. He has energized and inspired a generation of young people who care deeply about our country and are building a movement that is bigger than one candidate or one campaign. So thank you, thank you, Bernie, for your endorsement, but more than that, thank you for your lifetime of fighting injustice. I am proud to be fighting alongside you. We accept $20, $27 donations too, you know. So John, from the use of the Springsteen song that was familiar to Sanders rallies uh, and Hillary Clinton mentioning and praising Jane Sanders, could this event have gone any better from the point of view of the Clinton campaign? Well, it could have gone a little better um, in the sense that it would have been nice if there weren't Sanders supporters at this, at this event holding up signs that say, won't vote for Hillary. Um, and, and so there's still some, I think, the, among Bernie Sanders' people, even in an event like this, there's still some resistance and reluctance to come around Hillary Clinton. Bernie Sanders could not have performed better and could not have done more. He performed, he did exactly what the Clinton campaign would have asked him to do. Uh, what he does after this event matters a lot, but the event was very good from Hillary Clinton's point of view, but the, still, the question still remains, um, how many of those 13 million votes that, got, that Bernie Sanders got in the primaries and, and, and caucuses will end up with Hillary Clinton? That's a big question. I had in my mind's eye what this event might look like if it went well, and Sanders' performance exceeded that from the Clinton point of view. He very cleverly talked to his supporters about all the issues he talked about in this campaign, where there was overlap with Hillary Clinton, and he obviously edited out any areas where there was disagreement. And I thought stylistically he was very warm to her, the use of first names, et cetera. I do agree that it's going to be hard to bring all of his supporters along, but I thought today was as bad as good as it could be. Curious to see what he does with his mailing list, how he campaigns for her, whether he keeps it up. But this, this means that Philadelphia will be about unity and brotherly and sisterly love rather than any lingering fights, and that's very good news for the Democrats. Right, you'll find, uh, I just was looking at this on the New York Times, the, on the homepage of the New York Times, the headline says, Clinton gets endorsement from Sanders' unifying party. It's a rather hopeful version. And then the actual story says, gets endorsement from Sanders hoping to unify party, which is a more accurate assessment of the situation. Um, I, it, she got, I think she would have liked to get this endorsement maybe a little earlier to give them both a little time to bring their people together before they get to Philadelphia. But I do think there's enough time now, especially if Sanders after today goes forward and continues to echo the message that he gave from the stage today. That's another big question. Was this just a one day thing for Bernie Sanders or does he now fight uh, uh, metaphorically at Clinton's side from this day forward. Um, if he does that, she has a pretty good chance, I think, of pulling it all together. Very strong pushback from the Trump campaign today, largely talking about yeah. how this is an odd couple and they don't really match, rather than doing what some Republicans would do, which is to try to pu push Sanders uh, Clinton to the left, saying she's basically agreeing now with the Democratic right. Socialists. Right. But right. that's not the tack Trump was yeah. taking today, at least not so far. Yeah, of course, I mean, because Sanders agrees with uh, Trump on a fair number of things. Um, anyway, when we come back, we will hear some of the president's speeches, that is Bush and Obama, in Dallas today, and we'll talk about those right after this.
Welcome back. Split show tonight. Johnstone, Cleveland. I'm here in Indianapolis where Donald Trump and Mike Pence are appearing this evening. More on that later. Now, though, we wanted to show, talk more and show you more of the remarkable memorial service in Dallas today. President Obama, George W. Bush paying tribute to the five police officers who were ambushed and shot and killed last week. It was a ceremony of music, of poetry, and of moving pleas for racial, racial reconciliation. Joining us now from Washington, Bloomberg Politics Senior White House Correspondent, our colleague Margaret Talib, to talk more about it. So, Margaret, we know the president labors over these things. Talk about what you know about how he prepared for and worked on the presentation today that was so moving and got such high marks. Yeah, the White House telling us today, uh, and our colleague Justin Sink, who was on Air Force One and in Dallas, uh, that the president was up late into the night finishing the speech and, and went back to the Bible to consult scripture. And we saw that today uh, as he quoted a passage uh, from uh, Ezekiel about um, turning a heart of stone into a heart of flesh and basically implored Americans in the absence of <laughs> being able to find a legislative compromise on issues like uh, gun control um, to to ask God to pray for a new heart. I mean, we've heard President Obama throughout the years since the beginning of his days as a politician uh, go back to the scripture to find passages that apply. And his whole theme of, of hope and change has roots in the Bible uh, with Paul and his letter to the Hebrews. And today was just another example of, of his search uh, for words from the Bible when his own words aren't enough. I was really struck in today's remarks by what he said that he had come to the conclusion that his own words over the years have been inadequate. Uh, Margaret, that uh, struck me too. But before we go on with this conversation, uh, let's play a little bit of the, of the sounds, the sights and sounds of this day, and we'll come back after that. Lord. At times, it seems like the forces pulling us apart are stronger than the forces binding us together. To renew our unity, we only need to remember our values. We have never been held together by blood or background. We are bound by things of the spirit, by shared commitments to common ideals. At our best, we practice empathy, imagining ourselves in the lives and circumstances of others. This is the bridge across our nation's deepest divisions. I've seen how inadequate words can be in bringing about lasting change. I've seen how, how inadequate my own words have been. We know that the overwhelming majority of police officers do an incredibly hard and dangerous job fairly and professionally. They are deserving of our respect and not our scorn. We also know that centuries of racial discrimination, of slavery and subjugation and Jim Crow, they didn't simply vanish with the end of lawful segregation. And if we cannot even talk about these things, if we cannot talk honestly and openly, not just in the comfort of our own circles, but with those who look different than us, or bring a different perspective, then we will never break this dangerous cycle. With an open heart, we can worry less about which side has been wronged and worry more about joining sides to do right. Margaret, it strikes me that the degree of difficulty um, was very high for President Obama here, higher. He's done a lot of speeches like this, as he has said, but yeah. rather than just having, talking about a situation where there was a white shooter with black victims uh, or a black shooter with white victims, he had to basically talk to, about to both communities uh, and talk about both dynamics here. Just talk a little bit about that. To me, it was redolent a little bit of the Reverend Wright speech back in 2008. Yeah, this has been the central challenge of last week's sort of compounded series of tragedies, this slow rolling shift from these incidents in Louisiana and in Minnesota to this shooting in Dallas, which completely overtook those two events. And they were, of course, connected in the sense that the shooter in Dallas was angry about um, police, uh, you know, racial mistreatment of by police. Uh, but for the president, it's been a real struggle to figure out how to keep the focus on the concern about racial disparities in policing 
while drawing a clear line that says what happened in Dallas is completely unacceptable, but that there is a, a root, an explanation of this anger that also can't be ignored. And to hear the president invoke by name the political movement Black Lives Matter in the middle of a, this presidential campaign was also pretty jarring to Mir. I, I think he really pined over how to make these lasting points about how he hopes that white Americans, every American who's not black, can put themselves, try to put themselves in the shoes of what black Americans experience without sort of being an apologist for violence that's completely out of bounds. And that's what he was attempting to do by threading the needle in today's speech. It was really different than that speech in uh, Charleston, you know, a year ago. That was much more Obama speaking from the heart. You remember him singing Amazing Grace, the purple robes swaying behind him. Uh, today it was the Dallas police chief talking about Stevie Wonder and how he used to quote Stevie Wonder to women, young women that he loved, and now he wanted to quote Stevie Wonder to the crowd. It was him arguing from the heart, President Obama arguing very much um, from the brain today. Margaret, we know the president yesterday had a meeting with law enforcement leaders. Uh, and uh, the speech today. Any idea what he intends to do, what he intends to have the administration do going forward on these important issues that, again, are not new, but obviously now are at the top of the country's agenda? There's so little time left for any sort of action. And although you do see some echoes, embers of bipartisanship and the willingness of politicians, Republicans who have to run again for another term, to get on Air Force One, it is safe to do that if you're going to a memorial service. It is much riskier when you're talking about legislative compromises, any kind of action. In many ways, what President Obama is trying to do, uh, beyond speaking to Americans about an issue that he cares about, is pave the way for these future conversations to continue after, he's, after his presidency is done, to pass the baton to the next president. Margaret, Margaret Tallett, thank uh, you very one much. Of the other Sorry, go ahead, Jen. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Mark, go ahead. Margaret, uh, Vice President Biden has been involved in all these issues, was there again today. Any idea if he's going to have some special role going forward in trying to deal with this stuff? Yes, and they've already, you know, put him out there. He's been a credible figure to talk about these issues where among the sort of voters who, the minute President Obama starts talking about them, kind of they turn away from it. Biden has always had this appeal, and this is why we'll see him on the trail with Hillary Clinton as well to a certain demographic of voters, older, male, white, working class, Rust Belt areas. And Vice President Biden also continues to have those relationships in the Senate. The question really is, in the middle, in the midst of a presidential campaign, uh, will there be kind of that pivotal point, that turning point uh, that allows any real uh, action, any real legislative action with Congress to go forward? Uh, but, but absolutely, uh, what we saw with Joe Biden kind of doing this round robin of network interviews yesterday gave us a taste of the role that the White House still believes that he can play in the waning months of this administration. Okay, Margaret Tal, thank you very much. You. Coming up, a Veep Stakes update, Republican and Democratic, after these words from our sponsors.
to the Veep stakes now. There's apparently a new name on Hillary Clinton's list, short or otherwise. Today, the New York Times reported that Clinton's campaign is vetting James Stavridis. He's a retired four-star Navy admiral who oversaw NATO operations in the Middle East and elsewhere. He's currently the dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University in Massachusetts. That was a Clinton development, but more of the focus remains in the Veep stakes on the man expected to pick first. That's Donald J. Trump. In a different New York Times story, Trump, in an interview with the newspaper, said he'll decide between five top running mate contenders plus two additional secret ones he says he's still considering and make an announcement by the end of the week. On the familiar list, former House Speaker Newt Gingrich, today Fox News parted ways with Gingrich. He was suspended as an analyst, they said, because of all the speculation about his being on the ticket. Some, though, see the top contender as the Indiana Governor Mike Pence who is appearing here in Indianapolis tonight with Trump at a rally. Our reporting tells us that Governor Chris Christie of New Jersey, who campaigned with Trump yesterday in Virginia, is also still near the top of Trump's short list. So, John, we talked last night about the pros of picking Pence as the VP pick. If it comes down to the Garden Stater versus the Hoosier Stater, what is the political argument for picking Christie over Pence? Well, it comes down to a number of things, but the first and most important is he's a much more compelling figure, a much better candidate, a much better campaigner uh, than Mike Pence is. If you're asking for the comparative argument, why? Why Christie over Pence? That's why. He's, a, we will both say, the best brawler in American politics. This is going to be a street fight. Why not get a street fighter? And I'll say, there are only a couple things that a vice president absolutely needs to do, or a running mate absolutely needs to do. He needs to give a good convention speech, and he needs to win the vice presidential debate. And if you're Donald Trump, and you're asking who's more likely to give a great convention speech and win the debate, Christie or Pence, you're picking Christie. In Congress, as a leader of the conservative movement here in Indiana, Pence has played at a very high level. But he's not played at the level Christie's played uh, because the nature of the media coverage, because Christie's run for president, because Christie's been on the cover of Time magazine. He's gone through Bridgegate. And I think the, the, the one thing I'm hearing about Pence on the negative side, and again, it's a political thing, is he's not been through the kind of fire that Christie's been through. And if you look right. at Al Gore, Joe Biden, Dick Cheney, all three of those guys, successful picks for guys who won, all three of them had been through significantly more national fire than Pence has. The one time recently Pence went through it over legislation he signed here having to do with gay rights, he didn't perform all that well in the eyes of many people. Right. Right. Well, and remember, look, you and I both are aware, because we wrote this book called Double Down, we know exactly what some of the, de some of the stuff in Christie's closet is. He, he had vetting problems when Romney looked at him in 2012, and those might still sink him. And those are problems, and those are things everybody knows about, like Bridgegate. But look, when we saw him running for president, he did not do well in this nomination fight this time around. But he did have some great moments. And part of the reason he had those great moments, as he said to me at one point during the race, he said, I've already been through to hell and back. I've been through the worst thing you could go through, and I survived. That makes me a dangerous cam candidate. That, that didn't help him win the Republican nomination, but it could make him a really strong running mate for Donald Trump. Yeah, I will say, even though we're talking about the arguments for Christie over Pence, I will say there are two things about Pence we didn't talk about yesterday that, uh, and, yeah. and enough detail that I think are a big deal. One is conservatives love him. He is a grassroots conservative. Yeah. He is a legend in the conservative movement. Christie is not. Christie would have problems with some conservatives if he got put on the ticket. Yep. And the other thing is Pence, is, Pence is, a, is a populist. Pence voted against things in Congress. Uh, that, that the establishment was for. He's an anti-establishment figure. So while he's known in Washington, while he'll help with the conservative establishment, he also will reinforce, I think, in a strong way for Trump, the notion of being an outsider. All right, when we come back, he loves her, he loves her not. He loves her. Now he seems to love her. The entire history of Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton's relationship right after this.
Clinton, Sanders, here's what happened. 1993, they were friends. And I'm grateful that Congressman Sanders... 2016, they're back to being friends, but... Hillary Clinton and I disagree on a number of issues. It's been a long, rocky road. 2015, she launches campaign. Soaring rhetoric. He launches campaign. Same thing. We don't have an endless amount of time. We've got to get back. In May, he's not a threat. By August, he is. Her friends attack. I very rarely read in any coverage of Bernie that he's a socialist. Again and again. This is just standard opposition research. First debate, Sanders goes easy. The secretary is right. Really easy. The American people are sick and tired of hearing about your damn emails. After that, less easy. Things get worse. There's this, and this, and even this. She wins, he wins, more of this. And this, and of course this. I don't believe that she is qualified. Clinton claims victory, Sanders stays in. They meet, they make up, best friends forever. Joining us now to talk about the Clinton-Sanders courtship, one of our pals at NBC News, White House correspondent, Kristen Welker, who is still in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where the event took place earlier today. Uh, Kristen, uh, what surprised you uh, at the event today, if anything, between Sanders and Clinton? Hey, Mark. Well, one of the things that I thought was noteworthy was that this was, for the most part, a full-throated endorsement, and that had sort of been a question mark heading into today. He used the word, I'm going to endorse Secretary Clinton, and then he vowed to fight vigorously for her. So I think that's significant, and based on my conversations with Clinton campaign officials, it was actually what they were hoping for and more than they were expecting. Uh, so they think this was a major step forward in terms of unifying the party. I also thought it was noteworthy that part of this rally felt like a Sanders rally. He ticked off what he'd been fighting for and also ticked off the areas in which they found some common ground in recent days, health care, education reform, and of course that $15 minimum wage. And then there were those moments that you were reminded that not everyone is ready to get on board with Secretary Clinton. Before this event started, some folks were ch chanting, feel the burn, and you had some other folks who were saying, never Hillary. Uh, protesters shouting out amidst both of their remarks. So there was a little bit of everything and a reminder that this was a hard-fought primary and that Secretary Clinton clinched the nomination more than a month ago and that Senator Sanders wasn't ready to get on board. He wasn't ready to get on board until he could say to his supporters, look, we have come away with some victories here. And I think once he had that, those victories on health care, education, the minimum wage, he felt like he could throw his full weight behind her. If you look at the polls, majority of Sanders supporters say they're likely going to support Secretary Clinton. But the question is, uh, how vigorously is he going to campaign for her? Based on my conversations with some of his top officials, he is planning to hit the trail for her. And, of course, his number one priority, they continue to insist, is to defeat Donald Trump. Mark? So, Kristen, it's John here. Um, my, my question kind of picks up perfectly hey, from where you ended, which is, which is where you ended, which is talking about what comes next. What does the Clinton campaign expect now from Sanders, now that they got an endorsement and got it in pretty much the way they would want to have wanted to get it? Um, what do they now hope he will do for them between now and the convention and beyond? So that is the all-important question. I think, first of all, they're going to give him a speaking role at the convention. That's one of the things that he wanted. They would like to see him campaign as vigorously for her as she did for Barack Obama back in 2008. So that's the bar that they have set. Uh, based on my conversations with Sanders campaign officials, he is going to campaign vigorously for her. But how frequently is he going to be out on the trail? Those are some of the details that are still getting worked out. We did learn, though, just moments ago, he's going to go to this uh, convention and he's not going to fight uh, for any more victories. In other words, he's holding the line at what he has won so far uh, and has made the decision. And we are told it was his decision not to try to win anymore at the party's convention. Uh, campaign officials saying, look, he got about 80 percent of what he wanted in the party's platform negotiation so he can go back to his supporters and say, we did win some tangible things here. Uh, how frequently will he be out on the campaign trail, I am told that we're going to get those details in the coming days. Guys? We mentioned earlier, uh, reporting now, uh, that, that Admiral Stavridis is being uh, vetted by the Clinton campaign. What's the logic of Hillary Clinton, who's got, as Secretary of State, uh, a lot of, and, and a senator, a lot of national security experience? What would the logic be, do you think, of her picking someone with a military, not a political background? 
Well, look, a couple of things. First of all, this is a retired four-star admiral. He's the former commander of NATO. He is someone who could really help to rally military voters, particularly in a state like Virginia. That could play big. We always knew that she was going to look at some candidates who have a military background. I'm being told, though, based on my conversations, is he in the top tier? Not necessarily. Doesn't mean she's not considering him seriously. She wants to sort of have all of her options on the table. But someone with a military background, background certainly would help in some of those areas that I just mentioned. And of course, it comes after we learn that Donald Trump also vetting uh, Flynn, uh, Lieutenant Flynn, as a possibility for his VP pick. So I think that it sort of checks all of those boxes. But again, I think she's several days out from making this final decision. Mark John. Lieutenant General Flynn. That's Pr right. Personally, Lieutenant General Flynn. I, I, exactly. Yep. Sorry, I can't quite hear you there, but I'm, I'm just curious if you have any sense now of uh, any more detail about uh, what the convention element of this might look like, what, 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 the, what kind of a, a speaking role Sanders will have, uh, and, and about the, the ways in which they might work together to present a totally unified picture of the party. Well, I think he's going to have a major speaking role. We just learned that uh, Elizabeth Warren is going to speak uh, in the early days of the convention. I believe it's Tuesday. Uh, Senator Sanders, we haven't been given an exact date, uh, but I do think he's going to have a significant speaking role, and I think you're going to hear him echo a lot of what he said at this event today and this sort of full-throated endorsement for why he plans to now fight for Secretary Clinton to become president. Okay, Kristen Welker, thanks very much up in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We'll talk to you again soon. Up next, our new Bloomberg Politics poll. We take a look at college-educated voters, what they think of Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump right after this. And if you're watching us in Washington, D.C., you can now listen to us on the radio radio at Bloomberg 99.1 FM. We'll be right back. now from our nation's capital to walk us through the new results of our brand new Bloomberg Politics National Slice Poll, Doug Usher, the Doug Usher, Managing Director of Purple Insights. So, Doug, educated folk, what did we find? Well, educated folks right now are supporting uh, Hillary over Trump by a pretty fair margin. Uh, we have them, uh, her winning by over 20 points. Um, and right now, among white college-educated voters, 
It's a group the Republicans have won every election since they've measured such things. Uh, and she's trailing, and he's trailing by 11 points. So he may be giving up a segment of the electorate the Republicans have always won for the first time in recorded history. Uh, Doug, a breakdown in terms of Democrats and Republicans and, and how they're feeling about their candidates. Absolutely. So what we see is a consolidated vote right now among Democrats. We've got over 90 percent of college-educated Democrats supporting uh, Hillary Clinton as their nominee. But then when you take a close look at Republicans among this segment, you don't see consolidation. Uh, support is at 75 percent, and partisans really need to be supporting him at 85 or 90 percent for him to win overall, but especially among this demographic. Again, a demographic that Obama won by two points last time, but if you take a look this time, you see uh, Trump down by a fair bit. I mean, the real question uh, for them to be considering is not whether they can make up the numbers among uh, those without a college graduate. That would be extremely difficult. But what can they do to cut down these margins? Because right now it's very troublesome uh, for that campaign. And they've got to do something to change that dynamic. And do you think it's because of Trump's issue positions as compared to Mitt Romney or stylistic? What, what, what would be turning off the college, Repo college educated Republicans and others who voted for Romney? but are now supporting Clinton. I think it's stylistic, and I think it's policy. And I think another dramatic finding that we had inside this poll is just the huge uh, divisions that we're seeing now within the white electorate. So if you take a look at white men and white women, uh, you see a typical gender gap. Um, where white men, uh, Trump is leading by a point, but among white women, uh, he's losing by over 20 points. I think the real problem for him is when you compare it to what we're seeing uh, in the electorate overall. If you take a look at the Pew uh, results that came out just a week ago, you see that white men uh, without a college degree are supporting Trump by 37 percent. If you take a look at white women, they're supporting Hillary by 31 points. That difference on education of 68 points, when you look at gender and education, is something that's unprecedented and we've never seen before. And that division, actually, among white voters is something I think people are missing right now as they take a look at divisions you know, accurately uh, across race and gender. But there's actually some huge fissures going on among uh, white voters that I think are worth taking a close look at, look at. And education is a good place to understand that fault line. And, Doug, we tested uh, the three people who are most talked about as potential running mates for, uh, for D Donald Trump, uh, Gingrich, Christie, and Pence, with this college-educated group. What did we find there? Well, uh, I mean, I, I, the, the question right now is what, what is good in these picks for Trump among this, these voters? And, frankly, there are only two people that are almost as unpopular as Donald Trump uh, in this crop. And that's Chris Christie and Newt Gingrich. And in fact, if you were to go and take a list of people and say, who are the only people we could find that are just as unpopular as Hillary Clinton, uh, the answer would be Chris Christie and Newt Gingrich. Having said that, um, you know, they both have appeal within the Republican Party and to consolidate votes. I think a real question right now, strategically, is are they going to concede this part of the electorate? Something needs to change if they're not. If they are going to concede it, then the other question is, can they win by uh, building up numbers among the rest of the electorate, those without a college degree? I think that's really threading a difficult needle, because those are folks that are less likely to turn out, more difficult to com communicate messages around turnout with. And so you don't just need big numbers with them, you need to have a high turnout. So one would expect, from a strategy standpoint, that Trump should be looking at numbers like this and his campaign should be seeing what they can do with the VP pick and the convention and moving forward to try to bring down these deficits, because that's really essential if he's going to actually put together a winning coalition. Doug Usher, slicing it purple. Doug, thanks very much. Thanks very much, we'll guys. Have, we'll have more slices coming up soon. Coming up next, we'll check in on today's convention planning and committee meetings in Cleveland when we come right back.
stop Trump movement will make its final stand in Rules Committee meetings here in Cleveland this week. A successful coup is still unlikely, but here's one way it could all go down. More than 2,400 delegates will be here in Cleveland next week. 62% of them are forced or bound to vote for Donald Trump. There are 112 delegates on the Rules Committee, two from each state and territory. In the arcane world of rules fights, Guam has as many votes as California. Trump opponents would need more than half of those delegates, so 57, to change any rules before the convention starts. If they fail, the next number is 28. That's how many committee members are needed to draft what is called a minority report. That forces a full delegation vote at the convention next week. That means a chaotic floor fight is still within reach for Trump opponents. They'd have to convince 1,237 delegates to take their side. Can they do it? I wouldn't bet on it. Joining us now is one of the co-founders of the anti-Trump Free the Delegates movement. That would be Colorado delegate Regina Thompson, also with us. Bloomberg Politics reporter John McCormick, one of our favorites. Um, John, before I get to Regina and her uh, her th grand conspiracy to throw this convention into chaos, just tell us whether you think any of it's likely to play out in a way that she's going to make her happy. I think it's probably unlikely, but we will know better by late Friday or at the very latest Saturday when the, when the Rules Committee finishes their business and we'll know whether or not they're going to have a minority report, which requires a quarter of the vote. So, Regina, tell us why you still have hope. Well, because we've been working through our delegate list for the past several weeks, continuing to contact delegates, and we know that um, roughly 70% of those that we've talked to, which is, and, and it's inching up every day, the number we've talked to, do not want to have to vote for Donald Trump. Many of them are there under duress, basically being told by their state parties or state laws how they have to cast their ballot. Right, and so uh, that, uh, there's clear, it's, uh, you, you've tapped into what you think is a, uh, and a sentiment. Um, just as a mechanical matter, um, having laid out what actually has to happen between now right. and the weekend, tell us how you're going to maneuver your way to victory. Well, it's, it's talking to enough delegates to convince them that they already have the right and the responsibility to vote as they choose. And that's really what it comes down to. It's, it's already within the rules for them to do this. Right. Many of them just don't, don't realize that because we've been acculturated for so many years of just having a nominee and everybody goes and, you know, says, yes, let's, we're going to rubber stamp the guy and have a party and be done with it. And it's been decades since we've actually had some contention within the, within the delegation. Right, so your argument is you don't have to win a battle at the Rules Committee level, and you don't have to, that the laws don't mm -hmm. matter, the Rules Committee doesn't That's matter, right. all you need to do is just go into the convention next week and do what you want to do. Well, the rules already allow this, and they have since the beginning of the Republican Party, other than one convention in 1976. Delegates for 248 different instances have cast ballots according to their own choice and have insisted that their delegate that their votes are recorded that way it's, it's not new right john does that accord with your understanding of reality i think reality is again going to really depend on the rules committee uh if they are not able to get that minority report out i think there's an extremely small chance that this can happen on the floor you'd have to get half of the delegates it'd just be impossible to sort of whip that situation together so I do think the meetings on, on Thursday and Friday and potentially Saturday will be very important for this movement. Um, I, but I, I think we all have to assume it's a pretty big long shot. That said, you know, Mr. Trump wants good ratings for the convention. <laughs> and uh, something like this would be astronomical for ratings. There was a report in Fox News just now uh, recently that says uh, uh, there are those who are urging John Kasich to put himself forward as an alternative. Um, does your movement need a champion, an alternative to be able to kind of uh, to generate the kind of uh, uh, momentum and the kind of, uh, kind of plausible scenario, not just, hey, let's dump Donald Trump, but let's actually pick somebody else. Do you guys need John Kasich or someone else? Well, it, it would help some of the delegates that are hesitant, because that's a lot of the questions some of them have. It's not that they're not willing to do this. It's, well, what if we do and who's it going to be? It's the unknown that they're afraid of. So we know that there are other very credible, qualified candidates that are currently looking at whether they want their name to be put forward and whether they would, you know, a, a, whether they would accept a draft at that point. Right. We know that there are others that will be coming forward other than John Casey. Well, that's rather tantalizing. Who would those people be? My lips are sealed. Really? Why, why, why would that, why would one want to be would want to keep that secret at this point? Well, because it's it's their prerogative to let their name out when they're ready, and right. if, whether they're ready or not. So at this moment, do you know that John Casey is looking at that as a, as a as a plausible path? Well, I haven't talked to John Casey or his campaign, but I've heard the news reports, and I've heard you know a lot of 
people talking. It, it doesn't surprise me. John Kasich, look how long he stayed in the campaign right. when he shouldn't have been there. What's so your, no surprise. Well, what's your sense, when you think about these delegates you say you've surveyed who would like to get rid of Donald Trump as mm -hmm. the nominee, where is their heart? Who would they like to be the alternative if there was an alternative that were to step forward? Well, I think for a lot of them it's Ted Cruz because as it boiled down to where there was only two candidates, naturally, you know, and he had the, the largest number of delegates other than the Donald Trump anyway. So largely it's him, but for the most part, they're all willing to accept um, another candidate because they know that we have to stop Donald Trump. And so, although Cruz is the choice of most of them, right. th they're willing to go with another candidate. I want to bring in, I want to bring in Mark from Indiana, Indianapolis uh, right now to give you guys a little bit of a grilling. Let me ask you both Mark. first, John, first John McCormick. Um, if, if Trump picked a certain kind of running mate, say he picked Governor Pence, would that do anything or would that do a lot to try to uh, unify the delegates who don't currently like him that much? Uh, having, a, having a candidate to, to come forward? No, if, if, if Trump, I, yeah, say, picked Mike Pence as his running mate. I, I, don't, I have not heard that anyone is talking about who it should be, you know, who, who the running mate makes a difference. I haven't heard anyone say if, it, if it's Gingrich, it's better, if it's Pence, it's better. Simply, they want to know who the, the main candidate will be and who Donald Trump picks as his VP really doesn't play into this at all. That really surprises me, if I just continue with you, Regina Thompson, it really surprises me. Every convention I've ever co covered, the delegates are rabidly interested in who the running mate's going to be. You're telling me you and your associates don't care at all who Trump picks? Well, I think that it's interesting. You know, people want to know, but I haven't, I'm not hearing that that is what's going to sway them. I, I think probably the only one that would sway the, many of them, and I don't see the combination happening, would be possibly a Ted Cruz or somebody, or, or Rubio, who had a lot of support. I don't think that beyond those strong candidates that they were already championing, that someone that Donald Trump's going to bring in that was never a candidate and, and already had their passion is really going to make a difference. John McCormick, there's still no schedule of, what's, of who's speaking next week. We know a handful of the speakers. Mitch McConnell said today he was speaking. Any idea why the Trump campaign is still waiting to release the program? Uh, I can't answer that, although I did run into some RNC officials, some fairly high-ranking folks at a bar the other night, and I said, do you guys have a schedule? Does something happen at 8.02 and something happens at 8.07 and 8.17? They said, yeah, that schedule is in place. And in fact, it was going to potentially have been released last week before the events uh, in Dallas and elsewhere took place. So there's a schedule somewhere. It just hasn't been released yet, according to these RNC okay. officials. All right. Um, John McCormick, um, it's good to hear that you're hanging out in bars. Um, that's always where all the best reporting goes on. Regina Thompson, <laughs> uh, great to have you guys here. Thanks for doing it. Uh, we'll be right back after these words from our sponsors.
Before we go, you may have noticed that Hillary Clinton was very agreeable today during the Bernie Sanders endorsement. She showed it with a familiar Clinton gesture, the nod. We took a tally. Take a look. Thank you very much for your kind remarks. And let me be first great victory whose support for so many years as a mayor, as a current entire family. That was but a fraction of her nods. We're still counting them. Anyway, there's more from our new slice poll on BloombergPolitics.com. Next up on Bloomberg Radio, First Word Asia. Coming up on Bloomberg West, on Bloomberg TV, how political campaigns are using streaming services to reach young voters. From now, from now, from me and Mark, sayonara. I'm Mark Crumpton. You're watching Bloomberg West. Let's begin with a check of your first word news. President Obama traveled to Dallas, Texas today, where he met with the families of the five officers killed in last week's ambush. At a memorial service, he discussed the burdens placed on officers in the line of duty. For the moment you put on that uniform, you have answered a call that at any moment even in the briefest interaction, they put your life in harm's way. The White House says the president considers the killings of the white officers by a black man a racially motivated hate crime. Bernie Sanders has endorsed Hillary Clinton for president. The former rivals appeared together in Portsmouth, New Hampshire today. In other news, Theresa May has less than two days to build a team to rescue the U.K. from its worst political crisis in a generation. May replaces David Cameron as prime minister tomorrow. Cameron chaired his final cabinet meeting today. China is calling a landmark ruling on the South China Sea null and void. The Hague has ruled China has no historic rights to the resources within its waters. China claims territorial rights to more than 80 percent of the South China Sea. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Mark Crump. Rerun? A couple of hiccups earlier today brought back memories of last year's lackluster review.